Shall we just welcome them with a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. So um, I was going to introduce myself, but um, I just quickly wanted to mention here, um, the Yerex Group was a winner of last year's TT100 Awards, just to give you guys some context, in both the Department of Science and Technology General Director Award for Small Enterprises, as well as the Award for Excellence in the Management of Innovation for Small, in for small Enterprises. So that's how we are relevant within the Da Vinci and within the TT100 Awards Program. So, um, just with regards to an overview on my topic, I focus more on the understanding of um, your market in the management of innovation because I felt like I needed to address something that I feel is a need in, amongst entrepreneurs and small businesses, which I hope to shed some light on for you tonight. So, let's face it, no business can sell goods and services that customers don't want and still make money. That's why market research comes in handy. Discovering what consumers want, when they want it, how they want it packaged or delivered, is essential to launching or running a successful business these days. Big businesses hire experts to analyze the market. Small businesses are often closer to their customer base and can get a sense of buying habits, future needs, and other trends. So if it's so important for businesses to understand what their markets want <coughs> and need in terms of products and services in order to ensure, and to ensure they make money, then why is it that so many startups neglect to include the crucial role of marketing and market research in the initial stages of new product development, stage gating, and overall management of innovation? Reasons for failure. According to a study conducted by CB Insights, a company who looked at the post-mortems of 101 startups to compile a list of the top 20 reasons startups fail, the number one reason that for failure was that there was no identified need in the market for the product. Other reasons for failure also included things like they ran out of cash, didn't have the right team, or got outcompeted, to name a few. According to another study done by Statista, they also conducted research and found that the number one reason for failures among startups is because there was no need in, for, the, for, for the product or the service in the market. So why do startups opt to skip the step of market research prior to launching? To remain innovative, companies need to develop new products and processes and do it quickly. Product life cycles are shorter, competition is more intense, and customers are more demanding than ever before. Companies that fail to innovate face a grim future, and therefore many startups find themselves with a first-to-market-at-any-cost mentality. The problem with that is, winning, in the, winning with a new product is not easy. An estimated 46% of the resources that companies devote to conception, development, and launch of new products go to projects that do not succeed. They fail in marketplace or never make it to market at all. In order to take any business idea to the next stage, it's essential, to it's essential to prove, using reliable information, that the idea is wanted or needed by the target market. My thoughts regarding the lack of involvement of marketing and marketing research perspective in the initial stages of stage gating and new product development is, to, is because of no most startups not understanding what the cost is of not doing proper market research. So let's try and understand why it is important to conduct proper research. So number one, market research reduces risk. And that's basically the bottom line. The short answer is, doing business without market research is like sailing in the wind without a compass. The long answer is, market research helps to reduce risk, identify options, increase confidence, and provide an objective perspective necessary to direct a growing enterprise. And paradoxically, reducing risk helps you take on risk your enterprise needs to grow. Because armed with research, you can take those risks and shift the odds in your favor. That's a quote from a partner at Strategic Insights. As a startup, one of the core focuses during this time and phase of business growth is to minimize the risk to your business and in so doing, give your business the best shot at making a success in the long term. Number two, 
market, market research allows you to market more effectively. As a marketing manager, there is no sweeter sound to my ear than knowing exactly your target market for a product. By knowing who your customers are and, and what they need, their need is for your product, better equips you to tailor your marketing message to the audience to directly address this need with the solution that you offer. Not only saving your startup time and money, but also saving your marketing department from a lot of frustration. So number three, market research maps out your customers' needs. For this section, I will use a quote by Alan Rogic, Managing Director of Finifin, who describes the need for market research in order to map out your customers' needs perfectly. I find that market research an absolutely pivotal part of the product making process. I sincerely believe that launching a product into a void without mapping out the customer's needs and intent sets you up for failure. At times, the company launching the product will be very aware of its target audience in an intuitive way. For example, Facebook in the early days focusing on US students. And then maybe market research doesn't have to be as deep. But the less intuitive knowledge you have about the customer, the more in-depth your market research should be. Number three that we're looking at, number four, sorry, is market research helps you stay ahead of your competition. Integral part of launching your product and conducting product research is, is in the identification of who your competitors in the space are that you operate in. By identifying your competitors, knowing what their products are, and conducting a competitive analysis through SWOT, you, you can identify your unique selling points, your USPs, in the market versus theirs, and how this differentiates your product or service. Ultimately, these, t these type of insights will provide you with input into your marketing message, which will sell your products to the clients in this competitive market. Tell them what makes your product different, and in some cases, what makes it better. Number five, market research actually accurately gorges the pulse of the market. Knowing what the latest trends, must-haves, and developments in the markets are, you can easily adapt and forecast what the effects of these changes will be on your products and business. Number, number five, market research gives you information you need to launch the right products. As part of, this, of the stage gating process, after discovery and idea generation, as part of stage one scoping, to include market research as part of this integral step, it is, it is the entire process you will identify the necessary information needed to make calculated decisions regarding the launch of your product. And lastly, market research can save your business from failure. The most important research for, research for conducting market research essentially is the reason we're having this discussion today is to emphasize the importance of conducting research in order to avoid your business from failing. So how can you practically include marketing research in the management of innovation? To manage a company effectively through innovation and business development, you need structured and informed analysis. Using tools such as stage gating remains one of the most effective ways in which to manage innovation within a business. By including independent cost-effective market research in your stage gating and management of innovation processes, not only will you have greater insights prior to the launch of your product, but you'll also gather information to, to provide you guidance with regarding to which products to launch, at what time, and into which markets. Each innovation has different aspects, some, some referring to its value proposition, some referring to its future users, some to its probable responses from its competition, and so forth. And innovation does not become successful by taking one-sided focus on these aspects. <coughs> Hence, marketing research provides you with an in-depth analysis regarding an overall aspect of the idea or product. Or product. Through market research, you will learn about the processes of identifying ideas for innovation, strategies in different types of companies, as well as how innovation can become a part of the overall strategy of your company. So what are inexpensive ways to conduct market research? So you're planning on launching a new product and you're currently stage gating the product and we'd like to include market research, but you don't necessarily have the resources to afford extensive facilitated marketing research from a third party like your Nielsen's or your Millwood Browns. 
There are below alternatives to pursue. Number one, use focus groups. Once you know the type of target market you're trying to reach, who they are, their demographics, and so forth, a less expensive form of market research is to set up a focus group through people you know to pose and probe questions to. In exchange, offering these focus groups, pizza and wine usually works quite well. Number two, online surveys. Online surveys do have slight costs associated to them. However, this cost is minor compared to um, extensive third-party re marketing research. An online survey for research allows you to re reach various geographic locations, which might be difficult to do through alternative research like focus groups. A potential pitfall, however, with, with regards to online surveys is having the right data to send the surveys to as well as the response rates onto, on these surveys, i.e. how many people are going to open their emails, how many people are actually going to respond to them and participate in them. A boundary that focus groups and direct research overcomes. <coughs> Number three, spending time with your customers. If your product or idea has already got customers who are willing to spend money or buy into it, then one of the best ways to conduct marketing research is through spending time with them. By asking them probing questions regarding the usability of the product, who they think would benefit from it, and the price point, to name a few, you can gorge other potential markets to sell into. And another form of this is through design thinking, which is the best way to develop products um, through using an iterative development approach with your customer during stage gating. Thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to my talk. If you have any further questions or thoughts you'd like to share with me, please let me know. In the meantime, I'll leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein. If we knew what we were doing, it would not be called, called research, would it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Some time to breathe. Yes, yes. Okay. So, we, we had it. Um, and I'm just interested to, you know, uh, any questions around, 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 yes, Mark? Um, you, you talked about the marketing program that you've got in your, your strategy that you're using for Helix. Um, how is that going to change in the next 10 years, given the Internet of Things and everybody being online? And for market research and for... Well, you're, you're marketing your, your strategy. So you're talking about your research yeah. to develop your strategy. So how's that going to impact that? I think through you know, the Internet of Things, we're actually just going to have more access to information that we didn't previously have. So maybe things like using third, party, um, third parties for research will fall away completely and we'll have more access to, to our markets to be able to cater directly to them. Um, so I think those type of things are going to change the future of information and what's accessible to us and the way in which we plan to launch products and things like that. But um, within the next five years, from a Herex perspective and the way we do planning currently for our product launches, um, the Internet of Things, uh, I don't think currently will change how we, how we do it. Um, we still need to use relatively traditional methods and we extensively use things like design thinking to achieve our, our product launches. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Hmm. I was, uh, what was leading me into that thinking was okay. um, uh, Poppy Act and the recent changes in, okay. in, in okay. Europe and that must make marketing research a whole lot more difficult because you used to be able to get information freely, now it's being limited. I understand what you mean, okay. So um, I know if you do I mean, so if you use things like online surveys, I never recommend that you use people's data that you don't actually know. So one of the things that I mentioned is collecting data of the demographics that you're trying to research and using that data. That's why it's quite a barrier because you don't always have the correct data to send these online surveys to. The benefits, I must admit, of using external parties for this type of research is for that reason. They have people who have opted in they have signed up to participate in these researches and they are, have allowed these big international companies to ask them questions to get marketing research out of them. So that's a benefit that I see. So 
in terms of poppy and those things, definitely has made it harder, but there's still ways to, I think, do research in a smart way. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're breaking any laws or infringing on anybody's privacy, and you're not spending a whole lot of cash, um, like focus groups and things like that. So those are viable options that we use um, in the UX group to do market research. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend. It's a more personal approach, I guess. The African environment, mm -hmm. technology has come in, for example, mobile penetration. Yes. And we are having more and more users going mobile. Yes. And also the access to internet, through mobiles, uh, cell phones or smartphones and so on, has made technology such as social media quite accessible to, to many people or potential customers. So I was ex thinking that maybe you would have mentioned the influence or the impact of social media in your innovation strategies or in your marketing research strategies too. So I think the Internet of Things has come in, and I don't think it's five years away as you are, you are saying. It's now. It's here. Um, so I, I just I just want to understand because are you meaning of my overall strategy or are you talking about research in particular? Because I just want to split yeah. the two because social media in terms of my actual job is, I mean, cool. It is absolutely the baseline to what I do. So um, we use social media extensively in reaching our products, but that's already in the next phase. So that's already once you've launched a product and you're actually marketing this product to your target market. So in terms of that, it, the social media is integral to the success for us. Um, we use tools like Google and, and social media because they offer us abilities to tailor audiences in ways that no other form of, of marketing does. It just doesn't. And digital marketing allows you to tailor messaging to specific people. You can switch it off and on. You can change campaigns halfway through. There's just so many benefits to it. So um, I think in terms of actually launching a strategy to reach a target market, social media is very integral. But um, I, I have yet to use social media in, in a marketing research stage dating type platform. Um, not yet, no. Could, could I just ask something about your social media? Because when I see a big new advertising campaign for something, and I go on to social media, it's got 3,000 likes. And I'm saying, dear God, they've spent 181 million on this, and it's got 3,000 likes. Mm -hmm. Is it that just most people don't they might click on it and they, they don't like it or dislike it. Definitely. Um, I never measure advertising or my messaging's effectiveness through likes. Um, likes to me means nothing, if, if I can say that. Um, yeah. uh, I, I measure my marketing really on, on, on return on investment. So how many products that we sell at the end of the month? And it's always hard to track and really monitor those things. So I, d I definitely measure it on things like click-throughs more and, and obviously conversion rates. So ROIs on the campaigns. How much do we sell of the product? How much do we invest into the marketing campaign? So, those are, so in terms of actual likes on the posts, I, th I personally don't like advertising posts, but it doesn't mean I don't click on them. Um, but I just think it's a, I think it's a personal thing. You'll, you'll like a friend's post of their dog, you know, running in a park, but you won't necessarily like a product post of something that you may be a little bit uncertain about still. But for some businesses, you, you, you come into a market where you, after your research, you find out that what you want to offer is not needed. Are you of those people who believe in uh, changing buying behavior or like creating a need? It's such a, it's such a good question. Um, because there's, there's actually so many stories of people who have conducted market, market research and are told it actually gave them an indication not to do it and they just went on and did it and it became a massive success. So you obviously have those. But I think it all boils down to my first point is reducing risk. 
So it all depends on how much risk you're willing to take on to your business. Um, if you can risk it, if you have the money and the capacity and the resources to risk it, even though your market research necessarily tells you not to, I definitely think then, then you, you can do it. Um, but I personally, maybe I'm too traditional, but I believe in things like that. I believe in, in, in first hearing what the market says and, and first understanding what the need is. What I would do before I would just not launch anything is I would rather go back and tweak my products based on the research that I found to better suit what the need is that I've identified through the research rather than just saying, well, we're not going to launch anything at all. Just go back and that's, that's where design thinking comes in, which is something that we use in the Herex group quite extensively. We go to our customers, we pitch an idea to them. We'll be like, we want to work on this project. We want to do this. We want to add this functionality. Do you want to partner with us on this design? Would you be the pioneers of this pilot? And then they'll be like, yes, but you know, I, I, we actually don't think this is going to work. Rather, if you look at it from this way, I think we should rather do it this way. So those are design thinkings and iterative design approach, approaches. So I'd rather do something like that, like go do your market research, take what it says, go back to the drawing board, so not necessarily scratching it completely, just going back and saying, how can we tweak, tweak this to better suit the need we've now identified? Unless it's completely like no-go, then you really have to, I think, go back and think about it. That means uh, marketing research can also help you to orient your strategy. Yes, yes, no, definitely. Right. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thanks. Zane? Um, just, just to start with what, what you were telling in the conversation, I think that it's not so much for me um, a lack of appetite for risk, but rather that you have limited resources to take on the risk. Yes. But I made some notes while you were speaking, and, and I think we were talking startups and innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was that market research is expensive. It is. And you know, that's really what creates the price difference between patents and generics. And then, um, of course, you have the startups working on a shoestring budget. But then, how does one mitigate the risks um, to manage the budget at the same time to strike this balance? And then you gave some information around. The online surveys, however, I'm not too convinced about the credibility of using that kind of data to be able to make decisions. Which would rather focus me on the question that I'm about to ask is that my view on innovation from an entrepreneur point of view is slightly different. I would say that my opinion about market research, and maybe you'll have to convince me otherwise, is that market research, in my opinion, is limited. Because for me, innovation is not about serving a need, it's about creating a need. It's about finding that niche in the market. Because that's what Apple did. Um, my last visits to Google and to Silicon Valley was everything about these things exist. And I think market research comes into play that when you're in already in a, in a stable competitive environment, when you have the resources to do certain things, and you know it's my product against your product, and then we look at what the mass segment wants and what this segment wants and what they prefer, and we start bringing products to that. But when you're in a startup, it's about entering the market with something that's new, something that's unique, something that, that's going to create uh, a, you know, a, a want for this product. Because I think um, the market is saturated with products, but if you want to create something that's going to bring value to you as an entrepreneur, then you need to find something that people might not necessarily want. So you see that when you go to China, they're giving you things that, when you walk on the street, they're selling you rubbish. And some people buy it not because they want it or they need it, it's just because it's interesting at that moment. And that's for me what, what entrepreneurship is about. It's about creating things that are that are new and innovative and, and things that just intrigue you, even if it's just for five seconds. And if you can sell five thousand whistles or five million whistles just because the sound of a bird comes out of your make you a billionaire. So it's just a little weird way of thinking. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, it actually ties into what that gentleman said as well. Um, but I think my purpose with today's course in particular was that, um, that I mean, if you, ba if you base it on like the research, you can go look 
the, at these statistics mm -hmm. on startups and failures. I mean, uh, I, I proved quite early in my talk that the number one reason found across multiple research studies on startups particularly is that there was no identified need in the market for the product. Is there no lack of innovation with the research? Could be. Could be. Um, I just think that if, if you are looking at no need in the market for your product, um, that's because you didn't understand your product necessarily in the first mm -hmm. place. So I completely agree with you. Innovation is about disruption and putting a, a first out there. And I did mention that, but it almost comes at a first at all cost mentality because of the pace without sometimes just pausing, standing back and going, is this really what we should be doing right now? Is this the market that we should be launching this into? So that's all I want to create is that perspective, I think, to before you do something, almost take a step back and go, should we dig a little bit deeper? Should we look into the market before we do something like this? So, and, and if you launch something that's completely disruptive and it's a success and you don't have market research to back that onto, like you said with Apple and other companies that have done that, then that is phenomenal. That is really great. That is something that you can be very proud of. But unfortunately, I'm just looking at the statistics and the statistics do speak otherwise. So I guess it depends on the type of innovation you have and the willingness you have to risk. And I take you one step further. <laughs> For me, I think some of the that market research is something uh, it misses the obvious. And I'll give you an example. Um, Johnson & Johnson is an age-old product. Everybody knows it in the care of babies and, and household stuff. And suddenly, when Elizabeth Ann entered the market, you saw their, their, their trend and, and their business drop. And you have all these executives sitting in a room. This is a true story. They're sitting in a room trying to understand why is their market share taking such a drop against Elizabeth Ann. This is a trusted product. Uh, it's well known, it's well established in the market, why is it starting to drop? And they were really bashing their heads, so I'm sure they were going to get to market research. And they're going to spend lots of money to try and find this out and probably dip into their pocket again. And while these men were sitting in this room, there was a woman sweeping, and she was just an ordinary cleaner. And she was sweeping and she said, may I say something? And astounded, these very educated men looked at her and thought, what are you going to teach us? Mm -hmm. And she said to them, the reason why people don't like Johnson & Johnson versus Elizabeth Ann's is with Elizabeth Ann's, the hold on the baby powder is much finer, so it doesn't waste, and it, it actually stays in place. Which, when you use Johnson & Johnson, it just goes everywhere. They immediately changed the patent of the thing, and they went back into play. So, market research versus just doing some asking around your friends. Yeah. Once, once again, like I think a, a very great example of, of an exception, which is great. I think that is amazing that they did that. So, um, but I, I just think what I wanted to do was just create some. Perspective. No, you did. So you did. I think that's the only thing. I'm not taking yeah. away from that. I'm just saying my <laughs> bias is not to yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just ask? Okay. It's really yes. nothing to do with market research. It's just sort of hearing what a marketing person would say about things that you see or how brands advertise themselves nowadays, specifically in social media. And if you look at King Price, for instance, mm -hmm. and how the last two absolutely stupid videos that they've made are all very funny mm -hmm. have launched that brand into you know I mean everybody is sending it I mean I got the video 50 times yesterday when it launched <laughs> on WhatsApp from every friend that you can have and it, it like creates a, a an inexpensive way of getting your brand out there it's viral yes. it's yeah. very viral and it's actually very effective mm -hmm. and uh how would you incorporate that? Would you incorporate something like that into your strategy? And I think what's great about those brands are they are positioned in that way, right? So they've come up with a brand image and they've said, like Nando's. Nando's has said, this is the image that we want to portray. And that's what they kind of have to stick to. 
Um, I think for other markets, I don't think we all need to be the King Prices and the Nandos of the world. There's different messages for different types of markets. So um, I've always believed that the Herex brand, for example, um, how I look at our brand, we're very young and disruptive and we're innovative and we're a technology solution. So if you look at our branding, we've positioned ourselves very funky and very different to any of the other clinical solutions. And yet we're very um, traditional sometimes in the way we do things because I think that speaks to the market that we're trying to speak to. So um, viral campaigns, absolutely. If you want to do something disruptive, I mean, if you have a creative team internally, absolutely use them, get them into a boardroom, brainstorm. Usually these things work very well if you get a creative agency in to actually assist you with a viral campaign. Um, it's no guarantee that it will go viral, but um, creative agencies can assist with these things. But it depends on what, what I'm trying to say is it depends on what your messaging is, like what you're trying to sell. Are you trying to be viral like King Price in humor or Nando's in humor? Because those are the things that generally attract um, viral campaigns or it's something like social impact. So somebody's emotional, you know, if there's emotional connection, then those things also go viral. But it depends on what messaging you want to really um, I just think convey. that, I think they've been so clever how they've taken something silly and or made it yes. funny yes. so that people actually would watch. I mean, if you now go to YouTube and you want to watch some uh, doctor talking about corporate culture or whatever and you get an ad in front and you can't wait for the five seconds to go past to skip it, mm. those are one of the ads that you might, although you've seen it, you might see it again because it's a good laugh, you know. Mm. It's, it's, I think it's a, for me, it's just fascinating how you can actually take marketing and branding and it can go so far and you don't have to spend the millions that you used to spend on a TV ad or anything like that and I think there's a lot of brands that can learn from that, learn from that and, and, and more, use more of a, of a human story to definitely to, yeah. to actually you know, portray their brand. Yeah, you're touching on something um, very important and I think all businesses is to make it human. Um, I mean, we also do a big focus on making our products human, so we focus on the social impact messaging that we have, so how our solutions are changing the lives of people. Um, so just, just a word of like, the only word of wisdom that I have with these type of campaigns is, because uh, you work in marketing, I work in marketing, we are kind of more tuned in to pick up on these things. And you and I might pick up that it's, and remember that it's a King Price advert because we are almost geared that way. Uh, what I've also found with these brilliant ad campaigns is it's so catchy, no one remembers your brand because they're focusing on the catchphrase or whatever's funny about it. That nobody actually knows what you're selling. So we, we, and I'm not saying King Prices was an example of that. I think everybody knew that was King Price, but I have, there was a very good example. We were talking about it the other day at a family function, about a billboard of a new gym that came into the area and it used the words planet and, um, and obviously virgin in a sentence um, to play off its competitors and to promote the new gym. All you could remember is But nobody could remember the new gym. So everybody was talking about how great this advert was, but nobody could remember for who. So it's almost also just important to remember um, what you, <laughs> if it's not going to actually hijack your campaign. It's not going to, you know, spoil mm. what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Kenneth, I think you wanted to ask something? Yeah, but I, I think mine is more of, 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 of a comment that I'm trying to make and trying to link in terms of what, 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 what Zane is saying. That, you know, uh, marketing research might be might be limited to different markets. You know, I'm thinking about a scenario where, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Whereas there, I think it's, it's much more traditional research, uh, market research could work. But if I flip it on the other side, where invention is the mother of necessity, so it, 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 it might not work. 
So what I'm trying to find is, what I'm trying to say is that maybe we need to look in terms of how, you know, market research could, you know, supplement yeah, okay. a disruptive, a disruptive mm -hmm. engagement as opposed to where, you know, necessity is just the mother of invention. We just have to find what the market needs in terms of coming out with products. I don't know. I don't know if there was a question in that, but no, I just, it was just more a, saying that. Yeah, yeah just just okay. more of a comment in terms of saying, you know, I'm just looking at what's happening now within the fourth industrial revolution, in terms of you know what role does market research play there? Where what we're just going out and then there's disruption. There's disruption in cryptocurrencies. I'm thinking that someone, if someone has done market research on cryptocurrencies. What, what would it be? What would we talk about? What would be the questionnaire? What would we be saying? So I'm saying there's, there's just two scenarios. I see market research working where you know necessity is the mother of invention. But if the other way around and we are disrupting, maybe we just need to find a way in terms of how are we going to incorporate it you know, into, you know, into other markets. Okay. Yeah, Tanya, just a quick one from my side. Okay. Um, I, I heard you mentioning uh, there's a stage 18. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just started questioning in my mind, is, um, is, it, is it more a project management um, type of term or is it a marketing term? So we actually use stage gating in a product life cycle term. So, um, we do it from uh, not from a marketing core drive necessarily. That is more a company drive. So the product managers, if they do new product research or things like that, they use stage gating. Um, my role in that, where I see marketing fit in, is initially in stage one with scoping. So ideally, understanding once you've generated an idea, you know kind of going to market research to validate the idea before you um, kind of invest in the, in the other stages. So um, it's, it's not necessarily just in marketing that, I, that we use stage editing, we use stage editing as an overall company. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question for my side. Uh, okay, things are, I'll give you a chance now. Can I just finish with that one? <laughs> um, I mean, I know, you know you were talking about marketing in the you know, as part of what is the role of marketing yes, in, management. in managing of innovation. But um, do you think more innovation is needed for marketing? I mean, for marketing rather. Which one is going? To be oh wow! Important? Um, I think marketing is being disrupted just as fast as innovation is. I mean, what used to work doesn't work anymore, and marketing keeps changing and there's laws and regulations that are coming into play that make it harder. Um, so I think they both create an equal need, I think. So as innovation happens, marketing happens. Like, so it's, I think it's, it's a cycle. I don't necessarily think it's one or the other that goes first. Um, although I am leading to thinking innovation happens first yeah. and then marketing because of you need something <laughs> to sell. Um, but yeah, so... It's a cycle. Yes, it's a cycle. Yeah. I would say that. Oh, brilliant. To me? Okay. How do you find the balance between what has remained the same and what has changed? Sure, in terms of marketing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Would you say in terms of how I market my products? Yeah, how you market your products or how you do market research? Uh, or how I do market research. So I think it's... Um, it's established that what remains the same is that I do believe in traditional forms of market research. I do believe there is value in it. I've seen it myself. So I would say that remains the same. Um, what has changed, I think, speaks to what some of these gentlemen have mentioned in terms of different markets that don't necessarily need market research or how do we make market research fit like new markets that aren't identified yet. So how do you establish if something's disruptive, if there is a need, a, indeed a market for it? So um, those are the things that are changing, but the things that are remaining the same, I would say, are, are still that, like traditional marketing, I know I might get shocked for this, but traditional marketing, I still believe in traditional marketing, I use traditional <laughs> marketing. <sighs> um, I think there's still a need for things like 
traditional market research and, and things like this. You kind of need to balance the two, the old with the new. Yeah. All right. Round of applause for Tanya. Well done.